and I do think we have an important question to think about with these Confederate statues or similarly offensive historical figures like conquistadors in New Mexico and you know slave owners in Liverpool. The sitter of the statue should not incriminate the work of art necessarily in the sense that is it possible to remove it from its place of prestige so that we are clear that it does not deserve the prestige of a public location, but we still wish to preserve it both as an artwork done by a sculptor and also as a document of history. For the guests joining us, okay, we have Dr. Jeff Taylor, um, who is, is a scholar and expert also in art forgery, PhD. And we can talk about later. We, we happen to know and love CEU, by the way. That's a separate Good. story. We know a little bit about We've that. We've been there many times. Many times. Yeah. But um, for those who don't know, just just tell us who is Elmer De. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Elmer De Hori, yeah. His real name is Elmer Hoffman. He's born in Budapest, Hungary and became one of the most famous art forgers of the 20th century, largely working from 1945 to his death in 1976, but really until about 1970 when he was exposed um, and really kind of did the exposure himself by going to a novelist, Clifford Irving, who published a book about him that became a bestseller that told his whole story and he really worked in genres and periods he knew very well. For a long time, he focused on drawings, kind of trying to fly under the radar, not making oil paintings. Oil paintings are much harder to make. You have to really have a lot of material. He only did the oil paintings mostly later when he was set up on the island of Ibiza where he lived there, where people didn't even know he was an art forger. They just thought he was a Hungarian right. aristocrat. And he loved the glamorous life, which Ibiza was known for. And uh, after he, you know, was, the book came out and then everyone knew he was this art forger. He had about six years of real celebrity life there on Ibiza where, you know, he really did know kind of the, and if anything, Elmir loved that. He didn't really like working hard. He liked, he liked celebrity. You know, his, his dad was a bricklayer. So where did this artistic, I mean, you know, he's obviously an incredible artist. Yeah. I mean, like, where yeah, did that so, come from? Okay. So he's, a, okay. Let's start with two kind of sociological factors that will often come into art forgery. He's an outsider in two categories. He's a Jew, but he's also gay. Okay. So one of the things we point out, if you are a Jew and gay in the 1930s and 40s, you learn deception as right. a survival skill. Right. Right. So wow. for, for that reason, I think he was born. In, but we know he was doing forms of deception and fraud back in the late 20s. We have, you know, police records of him being um, charged with. Uh, check fraud, right. uh, document forgery. And this was a crime back then, impersonation of a person of title, which you could not do. You can't say right. I am a baron if you're not. Right. And um, and so so for that reason. Um, you know, yeah. that, that time he grew up in, in Hungary, then that's before World War II, which, uh, yeah. from, you know, what, what was it like in Hungary then? Oh, you know, I used to be a tour guide in Hungary and Central Europe and Vienna and Prague as well, but especially Budapest because I lived there for a long time and trying to explain that period is so hard. Yeah, because um, that's before the the arrow cross and all of that. It's yeah, like but they're there. It's creeping. Okay, so to call it fascism, you know, especially mm -hmm. if you went to the Central European University, you can't just throw that word around because we can parse <laughs> it for like weeks. Yeah, but fascism. Yeah. You know, so it's I best I would call it semi-fascist. Right. Um, the reign of Admiral Horty. I mean, it depends what you define fascism as. Right. Um, you know, yeah. um, he's he's certainly anti-Semite. They passed some anti-Jewish laws. Mm -hmm. But it was and, also, a, at that time, it was a 
center of cultural excellence, you know, yeah, with the yeah. opera and the, yeah. you know, you know, all the other things. So he, he must have grown up in a very unusual time, you know? He did. He did. I mean, it really was. I mean, he was came of age in kind of the golden age of Budapest and and would have known, um, you know, high class life. And, you know, he wanted to be a painter like the successful painters of the era. He mm -hmm. wanted to go to Paris and be somebody. We do think he wanted to be a painter. Um, we also think he wanted to be an aristocrat. Right. And, yeah. And that was also a thing because in the late Habsburg Empire, mm -hmm. there was a phenomenon of Jewish barons. Yeah. Right. And it wasn't impossible for a Jew to become a baron. Right. And it's not an overstatement either to say that a lot of the Jewish population of the late empire were kind of obsessed with getting aristocratic. Like that was what they really wanted. Right. Because um, there were some of them who did it. Mm -hmm. uh, and and in general, it was something as a Jew you couldn't have. You could mm -hmm. never, you could never be, you could be very rich, but you could not ever be you know, one of these ancient Catholic aristocratic people, but maybe you could. And so again, that's a real, I think at the heart of Valmir, that's an important obsession. Now, now um, he, did he have the sensation of going into a museum and seeing, you know, a painting on the wall, you know, and it said Picasso down on the bottom and, and did that give him a sense of satisfaction that, that it was in there? He claims to. Yes. Um, mm. We have a lot of claims that we can't necessarily verify, but we mm -hmm. suspect some of them are true. We know that he sold to the Fog Museum. They have admitted. Mm -hmm. Most others have never admitted to it if they have it in their collection. But we have no doubt that, yes, he would have gotten that experience, that thrill. Um, and, you know, I wrote a recent essay uh, on art forgers and popular culture, and I really want to highlight Elmir and his era when he really, you know, burst onto the public, you know, he'd been working for 20 years, but he became famous in the late sixties. Mm -hmm. um, this is the same time as the essay death of the author. Mm -hmm. Okay. So this key postmodernist text, mm -hmm. Elmir is the ultimate postmodernist artist. I mean, doesn't Orson Welles, look at this and you know the central question of fake is is you know what is fake what is yeah. what is real you know i mean what's the what because now we're getting more into the conceptual idea of forgery you know like how what, how do yeah. you how do you see that especially since you're tasked with sorting it out at a certain point yes we are we are and that's why i love that movie so much so that's what i was working on on this essay talking about elmir and talking about that movie because that movie is the ultimate product of death of the author period. And there are, especially some of those beautiful soliloquies that Orson Welles gives, he's basically expressing that when he meditates on Chart Cathedral and the fact that we know no names and why is that important? And why are we so obsessed with the name? It's here, there, we have it. And it's a beautiful question. It's one that I think has brought forgery constantly to the public mind because it is a wonderful intellectual question. And, you know, I concluded that essay talking about a Simpsons episode called War of Art, which if you see it, it's in season 20, War of Art. It is an exact, you know, how the Simpsons will often parody fame. It is the Simpsons parody of F for fake. Mm -hmm. And they go to an island and confront an art forger. And then there is this great dialogue between Lisa and the art forger about this very question. And if the essence of the art hasn't changed, why does your knowledge of authorship really matter at all? And, and what's, your, what, what's your feeling about that, Jeffrey? I get to ride both sides of the rails. I don't know if that's a good metaphor. I get to ride both sides of the tracks on that one. Okay, so as a, you know, a forgery, people who do art forensics, of course, we are very much interested in the binary concept of authentic, inauthentic, 
by the master, not by the master. Very mm -hmm. simple delineations. And we're trying to solve that. That said, as an academic sitting in my university office, I'm more interested in the latter side of it. You know, how difficult it is to parse down something like that kind of question of authenticity or inauthenticity. In fact, you know, a long time ago, I was working on a project where we were investigating fraud in the online art marketplace at some of the larger online auction sites. So I had to create a taxonomy of fake. And I tried to break down how many different ways a thing could be kind of fake or not what it purports to be or in some way inauthentic. Right. I came up with 19. 19 different ways that a thing could be fake, mm -hmm. depending on what it is, depending on uh, what its market is, depending on what its market prize is, and so many different variations. But now, can you give us a few, though? Just give us a taste of what that now, is. Well, among other things, I tried to break it down in the applied arts. It's so complex when you talk about a, a mass manufactured product. Um, I got a Behind me, I got a that's, a, that's a fake. That's a picture there. You can see there that chair mm -hmm. in that poster. Mm -hmm. That's the best fake I've ever seen. That's a fake Tonnet number 14 chair. Mm -hmm. The Tonnet number 14 chair over there, that's a poster. You probably can't see it too well. But it was a, it's the most mass manufactured chair in history. It's the, what we call the cafe chair, made right. by the famous Tonnet company. Um, Yet they had numerous brand X competitors who you could say it's a Tonne chair, but it's not really by Tonne. It's by, um, you know, the Mundus chair factory. Um, there are ones from the golden age around the early 20th century and the ones from the 1920s aren't as valuable. So you can have golden age, you can have silver age. It's not inauthentic. It's just not the primary period that the collectors cultivate. But what I love about this chair here, that one was made in the German East Africa in 1895 by an African craftsman. It's the best, it's the only example I know where the forgery is much more valuable than the original because it was a forgery, it was a copy right. of the number 14 chair, but it was made in the most, and the number 14 chair, remember, is the most mass produced, most inexpensive chair in history. This one is made in the most labor intensive, material intensive processes. It's hand carved from a trunk of the Moringa Ringa tree. Right. So it's the only, and, but it was clearly an attempt by a local African craftsman to copy or forge a number 14 chair. Right. You know, you started as a, a dealer, right? Like you were, yeah. you were, yeah. so, so how did you decide to switch? to being, a, a, you know, an authenticator. Brown furniture market collapse. <laughs> um, no, it's a real thing in the, in the antiques business. Around 2006, the market for European 19th and 18th century antiques just collapsed. Right. Um, and that's because designers in New York decided it looked too grandma-ish and that nobody wants that. It didn't matter if it was George III or Louis XVI. Nobody wants that grandma furniture, or as right. they would call it, brown furniture. Right. Um, so that really killed a lot of what I used to do out of Central Europe, which was particularly furniture, um, right. you know. But more than that, I was also doing my PhD at the same time, and I was developing myself as kind of an academic of the art world. And one of the things that I was fascinated with, really, before I read the book on Elmir, the book Fake by mm -hmm. Clifford Irving, but it did spur it. So I, I had already since the very get go when I was in the art business, um, I saw a lot of fakes, especially in Hungary. That's why the Elmir book resonated so much with me because like, I felt like I knew that guy because I knew that guy on so many levels. Right. Um, and, you know, what I saw in the antiques and art business in Eastern Europe was you saw forgeries and fakes at so many different levels. Mm -hmm. You saw the $10 fake, the $100 fake, the $1,000 fake, the $10,000 fake, and 
there wasn't much over ten thousand dollars in Eastern Europe. So, but you yeah. saw it at all levels, and you saw it in everything. You saw it in glass. You saw it in porcelain. You saw it in furniture. You saw it in, of course, paintings. Um, did, did your eye get? I mean, so how do you begin to discern? You know, from a ten dollar fake to a million dollar fake. Was it because you started with really working on high art, and then you could? Uh, what what what's that skill set? It's it's a hard one to explain. And I hate to give it too much credence because in some ways, um, what we do at New York Art for Forensics is the antithesis of it. But we do call it connoisseurship. And mm -hmm. connoisseurship um, has, has a very specific meaning in the art world. It's the ability to look at things and make a determination about attribution. Mm -hmm. Authentic, inauthentic by this master, by follower of the, you know. So um, you, you begin, you know, in 2006, you're just looking with your eye yeah. and having a feeling about something. Yeah. 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 So I started to, especially the Hungarian, um, well, furniture, I started to very quickly. You could kind of see furniture was less, you know, again, when I talk about all the different ways something be inauthentic, the furniture, the wood would be old. It had just been rebuilt. Okay. Mm -hmm. been rebuilt out of old veneers and old wood. You started to notice how that looked. And you started to see what a good one looked like. And you knew, and it just had a certain, and I hate to go back to it too much because it, it doesn't hold up well in court. Mm -hmm. <laughs> to say, oh, so, it doesn't look, but there is something, to be fair, there is something for that. And with the paintings, I started to get to know the Hungarian painters who were A, valuable, and B, likely to be forged. Mm -hmm. um, and you started to notice, again, these little characteristics of what the good one did and what the bad forgery didn't do. But it was also around this time, 2006, that over in New York, we started to see big cases involving um, art attribution questions, especially a lot of it in the field of mid-century modern, New York school, abstract expressionist. And we had competing experts going fake, not fake, you know, and eventually it would be solved through, you know, what we would call now art forensics. Mm -hmm. And that was when I was like, ooh, yeah, that stuff's important. And fortunately, I had a colleague who started the first art forensics lab in Budapest. And mm -hmm. so I began to work with them and kind of learn the trade that way because it's, it's hard to learn. There's not a graduate program for this. There's not a way to go. You just got to do it. So, so if I, you know, I have some painting hanging in my house and, and you know, it's a Gerard Richter painting, right? Mm -hmm. And I send it to you. Obviously, it wouldn't be if it was hanging in my house. But let's just say, I think yeah. that's what it is. Um, I send it to you. Yeah. How does it start? You know, where do you, where do you start to unpack the yeah. truth or not the truth? Yeah. We, um, now, we really, our method, and we're different than pretty much anyone else in the field, because we in, emphasize doing a holistic approach. So we we will look at the picture of it. We will look at the image of the painting and we will send our interns over to the libraries and they will dig up all the, what we would call comparables. So, and that is a kind of a connoisseurship question. Does it look like a Richter? Mm -hmm. Does it look stylistically like them? We're going to do that. Secondly, we're going to ask you and we're going to probe, what's the provenance? Where'd you get this? And don't take offense, but we, if you're my client, we don't trust our clients. Right. Believe right. what they say. Right. Uh, we're going to check it up again on you because people try to slide really fishy provenances past us. Um, now, would the provenance be, well, I bought it at an auction and yeah. I don't know anything more about it than that. Yeah. yeah. That's not good enough. So, so, so has that created... Um, uh, a sort of system by which people now need to not just go, well, I've got this thing hanging yeah. in my basement. I'm going to sell yeah. it. Does it have to be yeah. deeper in order to be? It does, if you're going to get good money for it, you're just not going to get far with, if it's a bigger name, look, if it's a lesser name artist, and let's remember the, the number of artists we deal in, in at art at New York art forensics, we get the same artists. We get Jackson Pollock's, mm -hmm. we get Picasso's. they are always wannabes for the big names because that's where the big money is. And, mm -hmm. You wouldn't waste time paying our fee if you didn't have hopes that this is going to be pretty valuable. That said, there's only about two or 300 artists in the whole world who are actually worth much money these days. 
The rest of them, even if they're kind of famous and you find them in the history of art and you might even find them in your old textbook, you'd still be depressed to find that the painting's worth about $10,000. You know, it can be often really demoralizing. <laughs> no. So what I'm saying is you could bring that, you know, people bring those paintings to us. There's only a handful of names and those ones need a provenance. Now, um, Jackson Pollock, there was a painting that showed up in a yeah. garage sale at some point. Yeah. Did, were you involved yeah. with that one or did you... Do you know what I'm talking about? I know exactly what you're talking about. Uh, I can't say too much. Right. We were um, not in the original movie. No, of course not. That's Peter Paul Biro, who is a guy we can talk about for years. Mm -hmm. um, he, uh, <laughs> Peter Paul Biro, by the way, what nationality? <laughs> I'm going to guess Hungarian. Hungarian. Ontarian, okay. Hungarian. Hungarian, yeah, okay. Hungarian. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so there's a running joke that I and my business partner, Tiago <laughs> Pipovarczyk, the other partner in New York Art Forensics, yeah, um, we have every job we do, there's a Hungarian involved. Why? Why? I don't know. I mean, I used to joke that I got my metaphorical PhD in art forgery in Hungary because they're the best art forgers. Because <laughs> um, I used to see it at every level. But it's a joke. But Peter Paul Biro is a good example. Um, as soon as I heard that guy in the movie, Okay, mm -hmm. I lived in Hungary for 21 years. I'm like, that dude's Hungarian. Because, okay. And <laughs> right. sure enough, you know, and if you follow the whole story after the Terry movie, you know, with the New Yorker article that kind yeah. of decimated his reputation. And right. so I have, to be clear, I've never met the guy. Right. But I've met his reports and his products a lot. So right. a lot of people who were dealing with him 10 years ago right. coming to us now, we're like, we need to someone legitimate because right. like, all he did was take our money and his reports aren't worth any money. So yeah. we've kind of seen a lot of his reports. And we're yeah. kind of like, oh my God. Um, yeah. But, um, but yeah, he's a real character. So anyway, the only thing I'll tell you is, this is really sad. Um, about a year and a half ago, um, we got a call from a lawyer in LA and they're like, we want you to test a painting, um, potentially by an important mid-century master painter. Um, you may have heard of it. It's often referred to as Terry's painting. Right. We're like, <laughs> yeah, yes. We're from, so anyway, we were setting it up and the next day Terry dies. Oh, wow. Okay. Uh, we're like, okay, we got to deal with this day. We'll get back to you. Yeah. That's all I can say at the moment. That's yeah. yeah. Moment. Now, uh, now, okay. So how many different ways are there to look at a painting? Cause there's so much different kinds of yeah. light that, yeah. that can be shined at a, at yeah. a painting, you know, yeah, that's, that's kind of the heart of it. Different types of light. So everything we're doing, it's one way or another, it's a type of light. Um, but there are a lot of different ways to do it. Um, so and again, it's, we use the metaphor of triangulation. One technique is not usually going to solve it. We got to use a bunch of different techniques to find out this. So then we know that. So then we know that. Right um, now, is that, is when you say a bunch of different ways, are you talking yeah. about, well, I got to shine the light this way, shine the light that way? Or are you saying, are you saying? Not, just not exactly. <laughs> That's one thing. We call that raking light. That is okay. a good technique. Very simple one, but a really good one. Um, right. So we start with, um, we start with a lot of um, what we call documentation. Okay, so we're going to photograph it really good. Right. With, um, good photographs and a good light. We're going to use just what we call normal visible light, but we're going to use it in different ways. We're going to take raking photographs. Mm -hmm. um, we're going to, um, sometimes we might shine the light through the canvas. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes we'll see interesting things there. Um, we're going to look at the back and the front. Uh, then we're going to use other tools. We're going to use two other, especially two other lights that are outside the visible light spectrum. So one, uh, I already have it here, um, a uh, ultraviolet light mm -hmm. we're going to use. Um, this is really handy. We have some powerful ultraviolet lights that we use. And um, we use so do you. So do you have a studio where you have all this? Yeah, light set this up is at our lab in Brooklyn. Right. We have a lab in Brooklyn. In so is that like a big room? Is it a small room? What's that? Yeah, room it's a pretty like? big room. It's about about a hundred. Oh about wow, fifteen hundred square feet. Fifteen. Okay. It's about fifteen hundred square feet. It's a. I, I want to give every. We don't try to give the exact address away because yeah, yeah. But it's in it's in Williamsburg. It's right it's in one of these artists' studio buildings. Everyone right. else is an artist, and we right. have a lab. And you're the right. artist. Okay. <laughs> 
In order to do what you do, though, doesn't it mean that you have to, first of all, have unbelievable knowledge of the the artist that is being forged? So how do you do? You really do. So how do you kind of, how do you do that? Like where, because, you know, how are you doing this deep analysis? Sometimes they're hanging in a museum or in someone's home and to do the comparison. You learn a certain, you learn techniques. First of all, you've done it for a long time. So my, you know, my PhD was in the history of the art market, but then I also got um, an appraiser's, a certified appraiser's level in impressionism and modern and really had to you know, study that sector really intensively. And I've just been doing it for a long time. Um, But whenever you get a job, you know how to approach it. So, you know, both me and Tiago were at different times fellows at the Frick Collection, um, Mm -hmm. at the Frick Art Reference Library. And so we really know the library well. And um, we are really able to go in there or we have some great research interns. We're like, okay, you need to look in these catalog raisonnés. You need to look Mm -hmm. at this stuff. Okay, looking in the monographs monographs for what was this artist doing during these periods and these periods. And, you know, we're trying to check up on provenance questions and these kind of things. Um, We know what we're looking for. So Um, is there at the beginning of a project or do you sit down with a, because that's a different group of people than the ones photographing the painting. So do you have a meeting at the beginning and go, okay, here's what we're going to do. This is how we do it. This is how long it takes. Yep. yep. That's what we do. We've got usually a team. We usually have me, Tiago. Um, we have um, an assistant, a full-time assistant. And then we have um, usually one or two interns who like mm. to do research for us. Um, so we usually, yeah, we start out, we get down to work right away. And, um, you know, usually we'll do the technical examination in about one day, um, mm-hmm. you know, and that's, you know, we can do that in about one day and eight hours, six hours. Sometimes it depends on, you know, how technically demanding it is a lot of times, uh, uh, Tiago or Vanessa will travel to the work mm-hmm. because if you've ever tried to do um, art transport, because that's what I started in art transport. Right. If you ever tried to do art transport in the greater New York area? It is mm-hmm. so mind boggling expensive. Mm-hmm. It's cheaper for us to go to the painting. Right. Because we've got like a travel kit, a big couple of big bags, reinforced secure uh, travel cases that we use um, to transport all the equipment so we can at least do the examination on site. Now, as opposed to the way they used to do this, you the, all of these lights are non-invasive. Yeah, it doesn't yeah, that's, add any- that's a beautiful thing. Now, there are still a few invasive things, but as you were saying, that's a big part of the improvement. Um, you know, one thing to keep in mind, we think of art forensics as a very new field. Like it's really only kind of taken off in the last 20 years, especially because a few, um, there's more techniques and we can get a lot of certainty about things, but it's older than you realize. Um, Tiago and I often do this lecture that we give on art forensics. We give it in Moscow and Paris and other places. And we talk about knowledge in art and its corruption. And we talk about the knowledge side. You know, the idea of art forensics, it goes back to Archimedes' Eureka moment where he tests, you know, to try to determine the quantity of gold in the crown. Mm -hmm. But already, again, moving forward, by the 1820s, we found books in the 1820s on chemistry of paints because we start to have microscopes And it occurs to some people, hey, let's put these paints under the microscopes and see what they look like. And the truth is throughout the 19th and early 20th century, you could know a lot about the paint from just putting it under a microscope. I mean, they really do, most of the basic pigments look different, very different under a microscope. Now, have you been in a museum and seen two paintings hanging side by side and gone, well, wow, one of these has to be a fake? There was a famous painter in the late 19th century in America called Thomas Harnett. And he was known for doing what we call trompe l'oeil paintings. Mm -hmm. Like he would do a painting and it looked like an envelope letter stuck to the wall with a bugle and like a piece of beef jerky. Right. People loved him because they were like, 
hyper realistic. They were truly Trump play. They really dilute you. you mm -hmm. Okay. So he's so successful, but working in the East Coast, there's a guy during his own lifetime who's so good at copying him that he sells. This rarely happens, but you have it sometimes where a forger is forged in their own lifetime by somebody who's so good. Guess who that guy was? I don't know a who? Hungarian. Don't know. A Hungarian? <laughs> no, it was not. His name was John Petu. And you know what? His <laughs> paintings hang side by side. So right. in, the New, in the Metropolitan, they got a little room to Thomas to oh, wow. and oh, the wow. Trump Loy thing. And they got his, and they got right next to it once by John Petu, but they're signed Harnett. I mean, oh. they're signed, they're a forgery. Yeah. They're signed Harnett, but of course the label says John Petu because they know it's on, but it's good enough that they still hang them side by side. Wait, no. I, I, wait I have this question because it, it, why are they, you know, why are they so revered? Like, what do you think that is that they become celebrities? You've been telling us about three, four of them. Yeah. Are they because they're getting away with it? Well, it's are they? Hard. Do they all have similar qualities to yeah, them? Yeah, they do. They yeah. all have similar qualities. Um, what are we, did a, we did a lot of study of forgers, and we came up with you know there's a number of patterns among the best ones. The ones also whom we know a lot about, so we can kind of profile them. Okay, so one, usually they are a frustrated contemporary artist mm -hmm. whose own career has not taken off the way they would like it to. What's wrong? Usually they're critiqued by their contemporaries as being out of date, mm. painting mm. in a retrograde style. Um, Van McGeeran, the one who forged the, um, uh, of Delft. Um, right. Vermeer, the Vermeer yeah. guy. Right. His work was critiqued as being too old masterish. Mm. Right. Now, Mir's work, this is interesting. You can find a review the first time he had a show in New York as Elmir, as himself, which he had in the like 1950 in New York. There's a short review in Art News, and it says his style is very Ecole de Paris. Now, right. Ecole de Paris, School of Paris, right. is an expression that we art historians give to like the 1920s in Paris. So if you call his paintings at Col de Paris in 1950, you're saying, whoa, these are out of date. You're like behind, you're 30 years behind the times. So they've been bullied by the critics. Maybe. Yeah. yeah, they hate the critics. Yeah. They hate the market. Yeah. And they hate Picasso because he's successful. Right. And they don't think Picasso is any better than they are. And it comes back to, again, the essay, Death of the Author. Mm -hmm. um, they believe that the author doesn't matter. Right. They don't, and they believe in the denial of genius. Right. There are no geniuses. They are just artists. None are particularly a lot better than the other. Just the critics have decided so. And, and do you think there are geniuses in art? I mean, do you think having spent a life in art? Yeah, there are some. And they are hard to forge. Gustav Klimt. Mm-hmm. Forgeries don't get very far in Gustav Klimt. Nobody can make anything that looks like Klimt. Nobody's forging John Singer Sargent. Nobody can do it that good. Yeah. But you don't think Picasso's in that same realm? I mean, just he, he kind of painted every so much. He wouldn't get faked so much. Yeah. Elmir had a lot of success faking his drawings. They were predictable. You know, um, uh, a lot of art, not a lot of artists, but, you know, like Damien Hirst, he doesn't necessarily even paint his pictures anymore. Yeah. You know, he'll give them yeah. to an assistant. Does that make the authentication process more yeah. difficult? Yeah. Hopefully with Damien Hurst, it won't matter. Yeah. Nobody's going to give a shit because he doesn't deserve it. <laughs> <laughs> well, exactly. But, but uh, I mean, I, I guess you can't fake a formaldehyde shark, really. No, you know what's funny about that shark? He's not the same shark. What do you mean? The most famous work of restoration. The original shark started to rot because right. it wasn't actually preserved very well. <laughs> wow. And it really was rotting and they couldn't yeah. do anything about it. So then it was an authorized restoration. I mean, David right. oversaw it. They, they caught a new unfortunate shark <laughs> um, and then got a proper, you know, zoological museum conservator yeah. to actually do it properly. Yeah. But and then they um, threw the old one in the trash and just stuck right, the new yeah, one in there. Uh, yeah, exactly. Exactly. <laughs> um, so, um, yeah, it's not the original shark. Um, 
Now, what do you take? What's your take on all these NFTs and all this kind of stuff where we're doing digital artwork online? I mean, like, you know, who even knows whether that's real or what it even is? And, and what? I was just being asked about that today. And I'm like, that is so stupid. That is like the stupidest <laughs> shit. I'm like, yeah. what are you even thinking? I want to own a fractional one one thousandth of a Warhol that I'll yeah. see. Like, yeah. I can look at, if you want to look at it, you can look at it on your screen without yeah. having to pay money. And, you know, in general, um, you know, as a person who also specializes in the art market, I'm just deeply skeptical about art's value as an investment tool. Um, right. I, you know, in my basic freshman 101 gallery management class, there's a quiz question after a reading. If somebody asks you if art is a good investment, the answer you should give is A, yes, or B. The answer is an emphatic foot pounding no. Oh, right. No. Yeah. There are so many reasons why art is not a good investment. Sometimes it works out that way. But no, it does not normally work out as a good investment. And people who tell you such um, are foolish. And you're you know, listening to them. What's the power of a painting in front of you just when you're, what, what's the magic of that? You know, it's so yeah. easy to understand the magic of a song or a- No, or, it is. You know, it's like, what's the, the magic that this stuff is out no. there? Doesn't it? Doesn't it say something about us as human beings that a few people can make these things? So there's a really important essay that y'all, yeah, when you go to, when they do art theory classes, you always got to read this essay. It's by Walter Benjamin and it's called The Work of Art in the Age of Mechanical Reproduction. It's written mm -hmm. in the 1930s and it's mostly addressing photography. And what does it mean now that, you know, you could run off as many photograph prints as you want, what does that mean? Um, and he talks about this idea of there being a kind of essence or a, a kind of a, something in the original work. Um, and I guess that's kind of the thing that goes back to it because the art market, when it began to appear in the late Hellenistic period and the Roman Republican Roman Empire period, the basic dynamic of the art market always is rarity. It's rarity that has been created by a canon. And why that happened in the ancient Greek and Hellenistic period is because they'd had things that were kind of like proto-art history. Mm -hmm. They talked about the greater masters like Praxiteles and Phidias mm -hmm. and, you know, as, and Zeuxus. And, and that kind of like the same thing that Vasari would do with the Italian Renaissance, that created a hierarchy of the named the a little bit named and the unnamed mm -hmm. okay and that creates the hierarchy of the canon and the art market directly conforms to it and the very canonical will become very rare and very expensive because of the competition of collectors and that's a dynamic that never goes away okay so rarity as the core idea in the art market is always there and that's a problem as soon as the artwork becomes mechanically reproducible if the artwork does not have a enshrined rarity it's very hard to price it do so we, that's why you do numbered prints if you're in right. the printing room because at least you're assigning a certain type of rarity to them do you those artists during the greek period or the roman period do, do we can we look at their works now or have they disappeared into the midst of you know trying to look for them most have disappeared um Praxiteles, we got some copies. Mm -hmm. Phidias, you know, if he did the Elgin marbles, we got those. Mm -hmm. That's pretty good. Yeah. But the paintings, the painters I refer to, um, we don't have any paintings. We have stories about painters, but we don't have any paintings. You know, the Elgin marbles, you know, do you think they'll ever be returned to the Acropolis? And does it matter? I keep wondering about it. I would have said years, you know, five years ago, I would have said, no way. No mm -hmm. way. Now, I feel like there are new dynamics. Restitution in general, based on especially colonial power relations, mm -hmm. um, are really coming under scrutiny. Um, and we're seeing movements to repatriate works that we never thought would have been repatriated. Um, the big ones don't seem to be going anywhere, like the Elgin Marbles, um, Nefertiti in Berlin. I don't think those are going anywhere, but 
I don't know. Um, I mean, do you ever, do you think we'll ever get those paintings out of Russia back to to that's Germany? A good question. Um, you know, that was a big restitution question I worked on because, um, and I did a lot of research on it in Budapest because. Hungary's big losses, biggest losses during the war. Now, the Jewish population would definitely lose artworks to the Nazis. Mm -hmm. um, but the bulk of the great Jewish collections, who were the big, big, big collectors in Hungary at that time, like Herzog and Hotfani, I mean, these were amazing collections with like mm -hmm. Tintorettos and Renoirs and Manets in them. They were stashed in Hungarian bank vaults and the Soviets took them because the Soviets said, you know, you bad Hungary, you were an aggressor. These are our reparations and we're mm -hmm. taking them. And they took them and they went to Russia and they're still there. Yeah. Um, and the Hungarians have been talking about it. But, you know, at this moment, Vladimir Putin doesn't seem to be remotely interested in any type of restitution. The problem is we don't know where they are. So we don't know if the works are, you know, they're not on display. They're not mm. on the, we don't, we, we, we honestly could speculate that they have been privatized um, mm. to um, certain oligarchs who may have just, you know, privatized it for themselves. I mean, truth in, in art, you know, the, the forger, the not forgery, the, the taking the Elgin marbles, you know, what is, you know, does it does it have meaning that you can't go to the Acropolis and see those things, which when they were taken, nobody even yeah. cared about at the time, yeah. you know? Yeah, it does have meaning. It does. The Acropolis would be better with them. Um, I think they might be too precious to actually put back in situ because the Acropolis itself is not, you know, totally. But, you know, the Greeks have built a very nice museum for it and an attempt to um, replace them. And... Um, and I do, yeah, and I do feel like um, they might belong back there. I wouldn't have said it before, um, but I do feel like there is a good argument for their return. Um, that, you know, things belong back in situ. Um, you know, so the two essays that you you mentioned, um, uh, would, would you mention them again? I want to put them in the chat and then... Um, <laughs> You know, because I think uh, some of our listeners might want to read them themselves yeah. and, and then pursue yeah. it. Yeah, and then well, one, other, one other thing, though, Jeffrey, I think it is interesting what you say about they should be returned. But, oh, but if we could, how do we, and you won't answer it today, maybe another day you'll come back. How do we create a, a, a culture worldwide of respect that they, do, that they belong there? Or when you see, you know, during certain really heinous crimes where people destroy yeah. art or they destroy you know, temples or whatever, like this, right. this what is art. I mean, that's a whole other thing, but it really, you realize the delicacy and the beauty of something like that. And should it live for the end for, forever, as Jesse was saying, but. It's a really potent question. Um, I get into a lot also with my students here at our graduate program at Western Colorado University, where we're talking about, you know, curatorial issues. And we talk about, you know, the, recent wave of removal of confederate statues in the south and not even in the south elsewhere too um of which i i think we just saw an article a few days ago on it you know just a still a fraction of them have come down but my students we would raise these questions because some of them came down violently and the statue was destroyed um and so we consider other periods of what we call iconoclasm um, going back to the second commandment, the, you know, prescription against idols, the uh, anaconic prescription, and how that runs through, especially, you know, we look, you know, one of the things I always tell my students, if you go to a museum of ancient Roman and Greek art, look at the statues, look at the faces, look at the nose. The nose is always broken. Yeah. It might be restored, but it's broken. And it's broken because people believe they had to kill the demon, demonic forces inside of that statue by literally defacing it, taking the mm. nose off. The Muslims would do it everywhere that they would come across, um, you know, Christian art or, or uh, Hindu art, uh, Buddhist art. They would, you know, do similar things. It all goes back to the second commandment. Um, and that's what we're talking about ISIS out in, you know, Syria or there were Al Qaeda groups in Timbuktu in Africa. They were doing the same thing, and it, it goes back to the second commandment. Yeah. Um, and it, now, it do you think up. that we should have um, 
we should shoot those with cameras that measure every single little bit of it and then we're able to reconstruct it after it's been destroyed is that i think that's a nice idea i think look i'm always a fan for conscious reconstruction not fake reconstruction that's kind of an archaeological taboo mm -hmm. but conscious reconstruction where you're honest and um clear about you know damage and original bits and mm -hmm. things like that or a copy to help us at least those are always great great tools um mm -hmm. and i do really value those um and, and I do think we have an important question to think about with these Confederate statues or similarly offensive historical figures like conquistadors in New Mexico and, you know, slave owners in Liverpool. You know, I think we have to talk. Our students often come up, we debate this a lot, and we kind of come to some conclusions after debating it in a long time. A lot of the conclusions are, well, it is an offensive person, but it is still a statue made by an artist mm -hmm. and if you go to museums of renaissance art you can find a lot of offensive people yeah. who are on the wall so again the sitter of the statue should not incriminate the work of art necessarily yeah in the sense that is it possible to remove it from its place of prestige so that we are clear that it does not deserve the prestige of a public location, but we still wish to preserve it both as an artwork done by a sculptor and also as a document of history. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. a lot of our students, after a lot of discussion, most of the time we kind of end up there. So that's wonder, a question for the audience, really, because that's yeah. what I'm going to ask you. Is that's a great, can you, you know, what is the question? Do What do we do? I've often thought that to the Confederate you know, statues, take, the, take it down, but let's not forget that it happened so it doesn't happen again. Yeah. How do we you know, balance. Well, take it down and it still might be a piece of art. Don't destroy the past. Well, yeah. that's, no, we need to understand also it's fair. It's a great question. For, to it leave is our a really good question. You know, it really raised another one. There was a General Lee statue. I, I don't know if it's still there, but it, it reminded me of an event that happened when I first went to Peace Corps in Hungary in 1990, soon after kind of the fall of communism. And the little town I was in Peace Corps, there was a Lenin statue because there's always a Lenin statue. But the people in that town had gone and dumped a bunch of yellow paint on it. And it got known as the yellow Lenin of Mohawk, mm -hmm. the town I was in, and yellow being kind of a paint, a color of disgrace in, in this kind of context. Um, and and then later they removed it, and I felt bad. I felt like they should have just left the yellow linen. Like, mm -hmm. just leave it like that. That's history. Like, yeah. that expresses the moment. And similarly, there's a General Lee statue where people wrote a bunch of graffiti over it, poured a bunch of paint over it, but it's still in situ. Mm -hmm. And you know, one of the things we talked about was, well, is that more profound? Leave it there, leave our commentary about General Lee there and mm -hmm. say, this is history. Once he was here as a point of prestige. And then we said enough and we did this stuff with paint and that shows where we are now. We see that with some of the Berlin Wall pieces that are yeah. spread out around the world where they still yeah. have all the graffiti on them. Well, I'd love to ask our viewers to think about that question because it is a really interesting, it, particularly in this time when there's a lot of conversation around, yeah. do we keep them or do we don't, keeping the artists yeah. separate. Maybe they'll answer in the comments. Yeah. Henry, this has been tremendous. Absolutely I've, great. We don't want really, you to leave, but yeah. we're, we're going to come Thank back. Thank you guys. This was so fun. Yeah, great. let's do it again. Thank yeah. you very much. Thank yeah. you so Thank much. You. Be safe out there. Thank you.